shortly after midnight three weeks ago a mercedes limousine with four passengers sped through the streets of paris following closely were some photographers on motorcycles pursuing a quarry they had hunted all day we now know the driver was drunk and traveling too fast as the car entered the tunnel under the Pont de l'Alma, there was an horrific crash which echoed around the world. We have been reporting this evening, Diana, Diana has been seriously injured in the Al Fayed apparently was killed in the crash. The accident occurred uh, just after midnight. Among the first on the scene were the photographers who had been chasing the speeding Mercedes. There is no doubt that while the dead and injured were still in the car, some of these men were taking close-up photographs. I took pictures, yes. How close did you get? Oh, I must have been 20 or 30 meters away. I had a 200 millimeter zoom lens and I took some general shots. Laszlo Verez was one of the 10 photographers arrested by the police shortly after the crash. That's him in the back of this police bus as he was taken off for questioning. He now faces charges of manslaughter and failing to give assistance at the scene of an accident. Did any of your shots capture Diana in those moments just before she died? I just got a glimpse of Diana as the police led me past the car, but I couldn't take any more photos. Then I saw Mr. al being given a cardiac massage. I walked very closely by, but I wasn't allowed to take any pictures. For Diana, the morning of Saturday the 30th of August had begun in Sardinia, off the coast of Italy. She was on holiday, but not out of the public gaze. The paparazzi had been following her and her lover, Dodi Al Fayed, for months. In the early afternoon, the couple boarded Dodi's father's private jet, bound for Paris. They arrived at Le Bourget, the airport reserved for VIP flights. If they had hoped to get away from the paparazzi, their hopes were in vain. The flight up from Sardinia to Paris was just under two hours, but somebody somewhere had tipped off the rats, as the Paris paparazzi are known, because when the Fayed plane touched down here at 3.20 in the afternoon, there were 20 of them waiting with their bikes and their scooters propped up against this fence. The photographers got their shots of Diana and Dodie leaving the plane, accompanied by bodyguards Trevor Rees Jones and Kez Wingfield. Meeting them at the airport was Henri Paul, the acting security chief for the Fayed family's Ritz Hotel in Paris. The party set off in a Mercedes in which the princess and, and Dodi were, and there was a backup Range Rover which was driven by Henri Paul. Michael Cole is spokesman for the Fayed family. His boss, Mohammed Al Fayed, is the controversial owner of Harrods in London and also the Ritz Hotel in Paris, where Dodie and Diana planned to stop by. Bike riders uh, with photographers riding pillion came alongside and were snapping photographs of the princess and, and, and Dodie inside. This went on for some time. Uh, the princess remarked, she was alarmed, she said, you know, one of these people is going to get kill themselves. It was so dangerous. And she was concerned not about herself, uh, but about these uh, paparazzi on motorcycles. Now, there's no doubt that the Ritz is one of the world's most luxurious hotels. Dodie and Diana arrived here at about half past four and checked into the Imperial Suite overlooking the Place Vendôme. Now, if you're not the owner's son, the Imperial Suite costs $14,000 a night. At 6.30, Dodie kept an important appointment at this exclusive jewellery store across the square from the Ritz. He had managed to give the paparazzi the slip and he went in unnoticed to Raposi's to pick up a ring he and Diana had chosen earlier. When was it that Dodi ordered the ring from you? Yes, it was days, ten days before the accident in Monte Carlo. They went to our main shop in Monte Carlo and uh, the couple. So. Uh, they asked us to, to, to give her 
uh, the, the ring in uh, Paris here in this shop. So they, they selected it together. Was it her choice yes. or his choice? Her cho choice, I think, yes. Were they engaged? This is the thing. We shall never know. If this planet lasts for another thousand years, people will still be speculating about this. Dodie never commented about their relationship, nor did the princess. And I think it is a fact that their very reticence indicated to me uh, the depth of the sincerity on both sides. Around seven o'clock, Dodie and Diana left the Ritz, headed for Dodie's apartment on the Champs Elysees. Once again, the paparazzi didn't miss the opportunity. Dodie's apartment overlooks the Arc de Triomphe, and perhaps here the couple hoped to share a private moment. It wasn't to be. When they arrived, other photographers were already waiting. Everyone's wiser after the event, but do you think it's possible that if the paparazzi had been massaged, they'd been given what they wanted, then uh, they might have got out of the way and this not happened? Well, it's interesting. The, um, one of the bodyguards who was with them, Kez Wingfield, has said very clearly that during that day they tried to reason uh, with the paparazzi and say, please give them some space, please back off. And the response was, we're just doing our job, and if you want to make any trouble, we'll get some more people here, and then you'll really see something. The couple had reserved a table for dinner at this romantic restaurant. But fearing they would be the object of the paparazzi's attention through the windows, they decided instead to return to the Ritz. Laszlo Verez followed them. Now, it's just two kilometres from Dodie's apartment down to the Ritz. Did you pull up alongside the car and take photographs? Jamais. Jamais. I followed behind, always behind, until we approached the Ritz. Then I went ahead of them so I could take pictures when they arrived. The Ritz's security cameras show a group of photographers and tourists outside the entrance as Dodie and Diana returned. One of the last uh, images we'll ever see of the princess is coming through the, her face, coming through the, uh, through the swing doors, through the revolving doors, looking stressed uh, by by what had happened and that her evening was being wrecked by these people. Um, the, the bodyguards didn't go and confront these people. There was no point. They are not susceptible to reason. You can't ask them to be kind. They don't understand the concept of that. That's not what they're there for. They're there to make money. Um, and they'll do it by any means at their command. Alerted to the unexpected return of the couple to the Ritz, acting security chief Henri Paul had also returned to the hotel, having gone off duty earlier at seven o'clock. What we now know is that by the time the security camera captured him back in the hotel lobby, he had drunk the equivalent of a bottle and a half of wine. Home for Henri Paul was just 500 metres from the hotel down this, the Rue de Petit Champ. It's a grotty flat up on the fourth floor of that building. He was called back to the hotel by telephone at about 10 o'clock. And what he did in the intervening three hours to make himself so drunk is uncertain. But this is one of the bars that he frequented. Did you ever see him drunk here? Some bartenders in the area say that Henri Paul was not known as a heavy drinker. Never, never, never. But there are other reports that on that fateful night, Paul had visited this bar and had two or three whiskies. The Fayed family released this video to show that nothing in Henri Paul's behaviour suggested he was drunk when he returned to work. And bodyguard Kez Wingfield told an American interviewer he believed Paul was sober. He was, you know, laughing at the way I spoke French badly. He was, he was as sober as a judge. There's nothing in his demeanour that suggested that he was in any way drunk. Um, if there had been, I would have sent him home. By 11 o'clock, a large crowd had gathered in front of the Ritz. Some of the paparazzi were surprised that Henri Paul came out of the hotel and started chatting with him. Over the past four years, he had never talked to the photographers. It was weird. So I listened in, but uh, he seemed totally incoherent. 
And what seemed really strange is that he was talking about the stars. Now, in your opinion, was he drunk? In my opinion, he didn't seem drunk, but he was illuminated. You know, his eyes were wide open, he was looking at the sky, he was wide awake, but he was somewhere else. It was alleged that the hotel had been negligent, that, that, that this man was drunk as a pig and in a highly excitable state. Those were the headlines that went round the world. Now, perhaps, these, uh, perhaps he was, but could the hotel have known? Was Dodi reckless uh, to get into a car uh, driven by such a man? Well, on the evidence, for all intents and purposes, he appeared to be quite normal. Around midnight, Dodi and Diana left the Imperial suite, planning to sneak out the back door of the hotel and drive to Dodi's apartment. Henri Paul waited with the couple until a hired Mercedes arrived at 12.15. Then, joined by bodyguard Trevor Reese jones the four of them left together, only to discover that the photographers hadn't been fooled by their trick. With Henri Paul at the wheel, the Mercedes sped off down the one-way street. But it wasn't long before the paparazzi gave chase on motorcycle. The police believe the car reached speeds of over 150 kilometres an hour. Just how close the paparazzi kept to the Mercedes remains a matter of dispute. Some reports say they kept up with the car and even got in front of it. Others say they were left behind. What isn't in doubt is the tragic end to this chase. Now we hear from Paris that there was a car uh, in the tunnel, a Fiat Uno. Parts of it have been found on the floor, uh, along with the, the Mercedes wing mirror, which apparently collided with it. But this car apparently has disappeared. Um, why? Why would anybody who had an innocent purpose in that underpass have disappeared? Do you think that you and your colleagues chasing Dodie and Diana caused the crash? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's not the photographer's fault at all? Uh, no. No, because we were not there. We didn't cause the accident. The driver was drunk. He was not himself. No one in his right mind would go this fast in Paris. And nobody is allowed to do that. But he wasn't going for a quiet drive along the river. He was being chased by you, the paparazzi, and your colleagues. We don't know that. We don't know that. It's easy to say, but... Uh, no one knows. Maybe he did it to show off in front of his boss. The fact is that uh, I can say that I haven't um, changed in my uh, firm belief that this would not have happened but for the unwarranted uh, and unnecessary and unwelcome harassment uh, that these people suffered in their last day together, throughout their last day together in Paris. But, Laszlo, she didn't invite you to take these photographs, these images of her that you stole when she was on holidays. These si, ones, si, these si. are all photographs ça, that you stole. Ça, yes, but I was invited. Ça, Look at Elle these. Exprès. Were you invited to take ça, this? Ça, she knew we were there. She did it on purpose. She knew perfectly well the photographers were there. Well, she's holidaying with the family. Tout ça, tout ça, Look, à côté, tout she didn't ça, invite you to take that. It did not happen by chance. But you'd made Diana's life miserable by harassing her over the years. It's completely wrong. For years, she stole photographers where she lived. When you are this famous, people are wanting to see photos of you. So maybe sometime photographers took pictures she didn't like. But that is the price you pay for fame. So this was all her fault, was it? Could I suggest to you that the attention Diana got from the paparazzi is part of the price of fame in our society? Nobody, nobody 
has to live their life with these pressures constantly in mind. Why should anyone have to carry on and conduct their everyday existence worrying about uh, these pestilential parasites? When Prince Charles and Diana's sisters arrived in Paris to take her body back to London, their faces told the story. But it was a week later, at her funeral, that Diana's brother put their feelings into words. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. Hello, I'm Amelia Adams. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for our brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.